everyone, welcome to Inside Rugby with Mark. If you haven't been here before, I'm a retired Kiwi bloke. I'm living in beautiful Cancun in Mexico, and I'm a huge rugby fan, hence the reason I started this channel. Now, the Rugby Championship competition is finished for another year, and a lot of you will be wondering, what are you going to do now between now and the Northern Tour starting of all the Southern Hemisphere teams? Well, I'll tell you what, I've got plenty of content coming your way right here on Inside Rugby with Mark. And today on the Monday show, I thought it would be a great opportunity, now the Rugby Championship is finished, to read some of your comments and questions, share those here on the channel, and get you to drop your opinions and views on these topics as well. So how about we get into it and start off with some of those things. So first of all, on the show today, some recognition and a huge thank you to Russell Clark 7726 for your recent contributions to my channel. It's helping me keep the lights on, Russell, so I really appreciate it, mate. Thank you very, very much for that. Now, let's get into it. And a lot of you have been asking me about the situation or the state of rugby here in Mexico, the place where I'm currently living. And I thought I'd give you a little bit of an update, first of all, on the, the channel today about what is actually happening with rugby in Mexico. Well, first of all, the game was founded here in 1930. And the reason for that delay compared to some other countries around the world was the British brought the game here when they were doing a lot of oil exploration in Mexico. But it was a number of years later, in fact, in 1973, before the Mexican Rugby Federation actually created and founded the Union of Mexico Rugby. And uh, that's when things started to really take off for Mexico. Currently, Mexico is ranked number 42 in world rugby, so quite a good ranking. It's gone up from 48 earlier this year. And they play some regular games, but the game is growing across the country. There are 20 clubs at the moment and 800 registered players in those 20 clubs. And they're played all across, or those clubs are all located across the country. Here in Cancun, we have a club called the Cancun Hammerheads, an obvious name for this part of the world indeed. But you might also be interested to know in Mexico City, there's a couple of clubs that have a little bit of an Aussie flavour. Yes, we have the Wallaby Rugby Club in Mexico City, and we have the Tasmania Rugby Club in Mexico City. So there you go, plenty of Aussie expats living over here in Mexico and getting involved in the rugby scene, which is a great thing to see. Women's rugby is on the growth here as well, so there's lots of women's team playing the game. There's a very good under-19 scene going on, and that's being developed as we speak. But the good news is that rugby is now being played in high schools and universities across the country, so I'm sure that's going to help the game grow, as we've seen that happen in other parts of the world as well. So while it's not a mainstream sport in Mexico, it is starting to get some growth and development behind it. One of the biggest issues for the game here in Mexico is the attraction of coaches from overseas to bring the game and the levels and the talents to another level. So if you're watching this video today and you're a rugby coach and you want to have a little bit of a stint in Mexico, well, get in touch with the Mexican Rugby Federation because I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you to help grow the game over here. So some real positive lights, of course, soccer, football, and American football are the two big sports played here, along with baseball. But rugby is starting to make some inroads, and I'm sure by the time we get to the Rugby World Cup in the United States in 2031, things are going to look a lot more rosy for Mexico. How about their standard of play? Well, a couple of years ago, in fact, a few, quite a few years ago, they played against St. Vincent and Grenadines in a test match, and they won 47 points to 7 on that occasion, so that was a good win. And they just missed out on World Cup qualification in the group over here in the Americas. They were beaten by Barbados by 21 points to 20, so they've been very close in terms of getting to the elimination process rounds of the Rugby World Cup. Mexico has not yet qualified for any Rugby World Cup in the past, but I'm sure they're going to be gunning for it in the future. So there we go. There's a little bit about the state of the game here in Mexico, along with its history. 
but I for one hope to see that it's going to grow and I'll try to get along to a couple of games and take my video camera along and show you what the standard is like here in Cancun when I get the opportunity to do that. So to all those people that wrote to me asking about the state of rugby in Mexico, thank you for the question and I hope my answer gives you a little bit more information about that topic. So the next question that came in was from Brent Blake 1070. Brent, thanks for sending this one in. The rugby championship has just finished off course and Brent's basically asking what were some of the players that stood out for me in the rugby championship. Well, there's plenty I'm sure that you've got in your mind, but I put a quick list together in response to this one for Brent, and I came up with these names as I tried to select players from all of the different nations that were involved in the rugby championship. So having a look at the list I quickly put together, the players that stood out for me across all of the games in the rugby championship this year. We've got players like Oxen Che, I thought he had a fantastic rugby championship, and not enough kudos goes to the props, I think, or the forwards in the game these days. So it was great to see Ox getting recognised for a lot of the works that he's done in the Rugby Championship this year. And then Sasha Feinberg in Goma Zulu for me was one of the outstanding players until he got injured in the Rugby Championship. And of course South Africa has this depth of talent, particularly in the number 10 jersey. And we saw Manny LeBoc's performance last weekend against Argentina. But for me, Sasha Feinberg in Goma Zulu has got that something a little bit special as well. He's got that fantastic feet of foot and he's able to get through a defensive line pretty comprehensively. And we saw some great play from him throughout the rugby championship. I thought he played very well against the All Blacks for his first experience in getting that high pressure situation under his belt. And uh, I think we can only see and expect great things from Sasha Feinberg and Goma Zulu as we, he goes forward in his career with South Africa. Some of the other players, for me, Albinoz from Argentina was outstanding in this year's rugby championship. I thought it was a breakout season for him. As far as the rugby championship goes, he scored a couple of tries against the Springboks, one in the first game, one in the second game. He's been good with the boot. And we're seeing something different from him that really impacts this Argentina team compared to when we saw Santiago Carreras in that number 10 jersey. So I've been really impressed with Tomas Albanoz in that jersey, in that number 10 jersey for Argentina this year. The next one on my list has been Tom Wright for Australia. Of course, Australia haven't had a successful rugby championship this year in the context of winning too many games. But what they did do was bring a new team forward. And I think what Joe Schmidt's doing is fantastic with that team. And we're starting to see the fruits of his labor. Tom Wright is one of those players that stood out for me. I thought he had particularly good games on different occasions throughout the rugby championship. He's an exciting fullback. He breaks the line well. He's good under pressure. And uh, keep your eye on him because I think Tom Wright's going to be one of those stars of the future. Next up for me, I wanted to focus on a couple of young players that I think have done really well in the rugby championships. And I'm talking about Wallace Satiti for the All Blacks. He's had a couple of storming games of recent times. And uh, again, another breakout season. And it really goes back to what I've been saying about Razor Robertson's selection process. When you give these young guys a chance, they're either going to embrace that opportunity and come out as stars like Wallace Satiti has. And I've got Cortez Ratama on my list here as well because he was given another chance by Razor to get out there and show what he's got. And both of those two players really demonstrated that they're going to be world-class rugby players. And that's been my beef with Razor so far. I just wanted to see more players in more positions getting an opportunity to show what they can do. And I've been focusing in particular, of course, on the number 10 jersey for the All Blacks and also on the number 13 jersey. But for me, Cortez Ratama and Wallace Satiti, outstanding playing throughout the rugby championship this year. Can't wait to see what they do on the Northern Tour for the All Blacks and uh, pat on the back to those two guys. Now back to South Africa, of course, and of course I could have put in pretty much most of the South African team, but I didn't want to do that because a couple of players really stood out for me. Another one was Cheslin Colby. We saw his performance against Argentina this past weekend. He's an outstanding winger, probably the best in the world in inverted commas for me at the moment, Cheslin Colby. That sidestep is wicked, but the attraction he brings from the defense, I think that's what makes him so special. So he's definitely on my list. Eben Etzebeth, well, 128 caps, the most cap player for the Springboks in all time. A fantastic achievement, and uh, I thought he had a fantastic rugby championship performance as well. 
And then alongside Etzebeth, we saw Ruan Norkia for a few games, and he was brilliant as well. And I think he's another one of these South African players that flies under the radar a little bit because they've got so many superstars in their team. But what I saw of Ruan Norkia, he was industrious. He's got a huge engine. He was going all game long, and he was doing some really good things in general play as well. So he stood out for me, a player that I want to keep my eye on, and I think he deserves to be in that Springbok jersey for some time yet. So well played. Ruan Norkia, I think it was a great performance in the Rugby Championship. And then two other players that stood out for me, Rob Valentini from Australia. He's been playing big. He was a good player in the Rugby World Cup for Australia last year, despite their performance overall. He's brought that uh, consistency into the Rugby Championship this year. And I think Rob Valentini in the sixth jersey for the Wallabies is something to keep an eye on. He's a special player. He gives 110% in every performance. And uh, I think he's going to be a big asset to them on the Northern Tour when the Wallabies head off in the beginning of November. And then the last one on my list that stood out was Tupo Bay from the All Blacks. I think for a young guy getting into that locking position, it's been hard for Razor to put someone else in there, isn't there? Because Tupo Vai has been playing really, really good rugby. So there you go. There's just a couple of names that I pulled out of the hat. I know there's many more. I'd like you to put them in the comments now on who you thought were the outstanding players in this year's rugby championship. But there's a few of mine for you to chew over and have a think about. Okay, so the next question comes in from Jeremy Marmon2949. And Jeremy asked me, how would you use Manny LeBoc in the future? Because it's one of the conundrums that's going on within the Springboks team. Well, there's no doubt about it. It was a great performance by Manny LeBoc against Argentina in the second test last weekend. And uh, he deserves all the plaudits he's get, he gets uh, from all of the fans of rugby across the world because there's plenty of non-South Africans applauding the performance of Manny LeBoc in the weekend. Now, if you go back and watch my videos from the Rugby World Cup last year, in particular the ones from South Africa's games, you'll see that I was a huge Manny LeBoc fan during that tournament. And I really saw him and see him as a future superstar of the Springboks team as they head towards 2027 in the Rugby World Cup down in Australia. I think this is one of the great conundrums that Rassi has now with so much talent in the team. Each of his number 10s bring something a little bit different, don't they? You've got Andre Pollard, who's that rock of Gibraltar when it comes to kicking. We saw it at the end of the game against Argentina when he came on and was able to perform those two great kicks for goal. But then you've got Manny LeBoc, who's able to do that wonderful distribution. He confuses defences and sets them off on the wrong channels. And that allows that South African game that Tony Brown's starting to bring into the Springboks to be able to go wide and expansive. So I think Manny LeBoc needs to be an instrumental part of the Springboks future. How do you use Manny? Well, I've spoken in previous videos about how I think Rassi's getting teams prepared to play against certain competition. And I think when you look at certain competition, the Springboks, they need to put a different kind of team out when they play the likes of England and Wales. And then when they play Ireland and France, it's a different kind of team that you need to have on the pitch, in my belief. And I think for those games, it's going to be a combination of looking at who's going to work best. We saw a great combination in the weekend between Jaden Hendricks and Manny LeBoc working very well. But what's going to happen when Faf de Klerk comes back? Are we going to see him and Sasha Feinberg in Goma Zulu? So I think this is one of the things that Rassi's going to be looking at as he goes forward with his selections. So I would see probably a rotation going on depending on what teams South Africa are going to play. We're going to see a combination of Sasha Feinberg and Goma Zulu. We're going to see Andre Pollard probably coming off the bench like we did in the weekend. And we're going to see Manny LeBoc starting other games. I think that's how Manny's going to be used in the future. But let me know in the comments if you think differently on how you think Manny LeBoc's going to be managed by Rassi as we head forward, particularly in the Northern Tour. How do you think that's going to work out? I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on that one. So Jeremy, thank you very much for sending in that question. That was a good one. Okay, so moving on to the next question that's come in. And this one comes from Neil Shriek Purvis and 4521. And Neil asks, what impact does the travel have on these players these days? And it's a very good question because we've seen the likes of Argentina having to get on a plane after that game in Santiago del Estero and head over to Mombella Stadium to prepare within a week to play against South Africa. And of course, if you're used to doing long-haul travel, 
you know exactly what it's like on the body. Now, for rugby players who have played a game, and I've actually reached out to some of the support staff and asked them this question uh, before I hit this video today, because I wanted to know if there are anything special that's done in terms of preparing athletes for these long, long flights across the world and how they actually help players recover from the previous games. Well, as you can imagine, ice baths are a very big component on helping players recover from games. So a lot of players, particularly if they're nursing a little bit of a niggle or an injury, they'll hop in an ice bath for 10 or 15 minutes after a game, and that actually helps to produce red blood cells, which helps them in turn recover a lot faster. But going against, against uh, time zones, that's a big one for a lot of players. And I think we also saw Neil refer to in his comment about, well, the good old days when you had tours, when teams were landing in a country and staying there for up to a month, they were able to acclimatise, get over injuries, and we saw a little bit more of an even playing field, didn't we, back in those days, because teams were able to travel on longer bases. Now, I'm an old school generation rugby fan, so I love those old tours, and it's great to see the tours between the All Blacks and the Springboks coming back in a year or so's time. And I think these tours are great for the fans and they're also great for players' well-being and welfare. And we live, in a, we live in an age and a generation today where there's a lot of emphasis on player welfare, isn't there? And that's why we have the TMO for a lot of reasons is because we're looking out for dangerous play within the game. Well, what about off the field when these teams have to travel across the world to play in games? Is that not also having a huge impact on players? If you know anything about long haul flights, you'll know that exposure to radiation for long periods of time, plus the disruption of sleep patterns has a huge impact on human beings. And I'm sure it does on these rugby players as well, even though they're very finely tuned professional athletes. So yeah, I think that uh, these schedules are pretty punishing. I know that a lot of Springboks players head up to the UK to play in the URC as well after playing in games in South Africa. That's also a bit of an issue. And I think it's something that world rugby in general needs to keep a handle on because I think player welfare has to be extended beyond just the field of play. And I think that's a really important thing for a rugby player in their career. Is there a short fix to this? Well, there probably isn't. And we see, you know, the likes of New Zealand, Australia having to go across to Argentina, and across to South Africa. South Africa, of course, going to Australia this year. So it's been balanced up in terms of each of the teams having their schedules impacted in this way. But that doesn't mean that it's always fair or it's always right, is it? So I'd like to hear your views on this one. What do you think about traveling when it comes to the impact on players? And what do you think about these longer tours? Do you think this is a good thing? Someone wrote in the comments yesterday about why doesn't Argentina have tours down there to their country from other nations around the world? I think that would be a fantastic idea. I, for one, would love to see it. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And Neil, thank you for that particular question. I thought it was a really good one. Okay, on to the next one. And this one comes from Nathan Weyer 4741 Nathan, I believe you're from South Africa. So congratulations to you on winning the rugby championship and of course to all the other rugby fans in South Africa watching my video today. Now, Nathan brings up a really good question and a really good point. And I wanted to share this one on the show today because I wanted to share my opinion about it. And I also wanted to get the, the opinions of the people from South Africa in particular, but also some All Black fans if you're out there watching my video today. Nathan brings up a really good point today. He talks about the expectations that fans have about the South African team and that they should win every game going forward. And if they're going to be a dominant team like some of the All Black teams from yesteryear, is that the right expectation to have? And uh, should we be allowing them to lose a game or two because Rassi's playing around with the selections or whatever? I think this is a really good point. And I've read a lot of South African comments in my videos over the last few weeks. And I tell you what, this is what I think about it. The world of rugby has changed. If we look at the Rugby World Cup last year, we saw those amazing knockout games in the quarters, semis, and of course, the great final that we saw as well. And it's so close between all of the top teams in world rugby. I don't think we're going to see a dominating era like we've seen before in world rugby. But I don't think we live in that era anymore. And I think because the coaching is so international, we're seeing players and coaches from different nations go to different countries and play. And this is upskilling 
the mindsets of these rugby nations. And as a result, we're seeing breakout countries like Ireland developing their systems, their academies, their player pathways, and it's having a great impact on the result. We've seen already in the short tenure of Joe Schmidt how he's starting to bring this Australian Wallaby team together. And who knows, next year against the British and Irish Lions, they may be a force to be reckoned with, but definitely by the time we get to the Rugby World Cup in 2027, I can guarantee you that Australia is going to be in the mix once again. I think this is a really good conversation to have and a bit of a debate. I'm sitting on the side of, I don't think that it's right to have the expectation of your team winning every single game. Of course, as fans, we want to see that. We want to be dominant. But I think World Rugby at the top of the tree at the moment between the top, say, six teams is so competitive that on any given day that these teams can have a win against each other. And we saw it in the Rugby World Cup final last year. South Africa won by one point. They also went very close to losing against France and England. Those were fantastic games. The All Blacks nearly lost to Ireland in that quarterfinal. If it wasn't for some heroic defence by Sam Whitelock, we wouldn't have won that game. And then, of course, we've seen in this year's Rugby Championship that Australia got over top of Argentina by one point in that first game. Then Argentina upset South Africa in their uh, first game and we saw the Wallabies get thumped by Argentina in one of their games and then the Wallabies turn around and give the, the All Blacks a pretty hard go in Sydney. So it's been really fascinating for me to see how close these games can be and I think as rugby fans we need to embrace this because it keeps us on the edge of our seat. I think it's great that different teams get an opportunity to be number one rugby team in the world and I would love to see some upsets at the next Rugby World Cup because I think it's only great for the game. But that's only my opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments. I think this is a really good question, Nathan, and it's a good one for all rugby fans across the world, not just for South Africans. So there we go. I love reading all of your comments and opinions and questions on this channel, so please keep them going. And if you enjoy this type of content, let me know and I'll do future videos like this. Maybe we can do one show like this a week and you can send in your questions and comments on any topic to do with international rugby. And we'll talk about it here on Inside Rugby with Mark. I could have done a lot more today, but in the interest of time, I appreciate that you're all very busy people and uh, I'll keep it to, just to those ones. So for today's contributors, thank you very much for sending those ones in. Thank you to the others that I haven't read out today. We'll do more of these shows in the future, I'm sure, and I appreciate it very, very much. Now, if you're enjoying the content that I'm producing here on Inside Rugby with Mark, and I want to thank you all for your wonderful comments and appreciation and acknowledgement of my videos over the weekend. There's lots of love out there in the rugby world, and I'm very, very appreciative of that. Now, if you are enjoying my content here on Inside Rugby with Mark, here's five ways in which you can engage a little bit further. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Over 80% of regular viewers who come back and watch my channel are not subscribed. Someone said yesterday, oh, I thought I was subscribed, but I hadn't actually done it. So please check. If you haven't subscribed, hit that button today and become one of our global family here on Inside Rugby with Mark. I would really, really appreciate it. There's some other ways that you you can get engaged in the channel. I'm here for the long run. We're going to go big on this channel in the future. I hope to start traveling and getting around parts of the world where we can talk about rugby up close and personal. That's one of the ambitions I have. So if you want to keep supporting me on that journey, I would be very, very grateful. So there we go. That's the end of the Monday show here on Inside Rugby with Mark. I hope you've all recovered from the weekend. There's plenty to talk about. Some people were saying, well, what are we going to do now that the rugby championship's finished and we've got to wait until the Northern Tours happen? Well, don't you fear. I'm going to have a lot of content coming out here on my channel talking about the aftermath of the rugby championship. What did we learn from all of the teams? I've got lots of opinions I want to share with you on that lot from every country that was involved in the rugby championship. And that will be a nice precursor for us to get excited about the Northern Tours that are going to happen in the next few weeks. So there we go. Another reason to to stick around here on the, the channel. Now, I wish you all a very safe and happy day out there in rugby land. I hope you're all doing very well. I want to thank you for your support once again, and I'll see you again very soon from here in beautiful Cancun in Mexico. Until next time, it's time to say adios from here in Cancun. Bye for now.